to everyone joining us on our 160th echo session. Special welcome to Yeta District Hospital, Namwala District Hospital, Western PHO, uh, Pinta Singongo Police Post. So apparently this is a clinic and I always thought it was a person. So, <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sombo. Thank you. <laughs> I always used to say, Peter Singongo, say something. Yes. I was <laughs> it's, the of, Peter... <laughs> it's, the, it's the name of the facility. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed, but thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. So we have Nakonde District Hospital, Nakonde Urban Hospital, and a special welcome. I've seen we've been joined by uh, Dr. Nguni. Thank you so much for joining us. So today's session, we are being supported by a group of expert psychiatrists, very experienced in this field. We have Dr. Francis Simenda uh, with Dr. Angel Chiria and Dr. Venevivi Lekani. Before we go into today's session, just a reminder that we've had two previous sessions that have introduced the common elements of treatment approaches, which is CETA which is uh, going to be taken to scale nationwide. So today's session is actually just a follow-up of those sessions, picking up on new life cases, because with time, we've realized that these conditions are actually more complex than meets the eye, and we need to explore uh, more of the cases for us to get perspective into how to support and manage these types of clients. With that said, Madam Nomsa, may you please give us a recap of last week's session? Thank you so much, Dr. Sombo. Good afternoon, um, everyone in the network. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Nomsa Siamans. I work for Japaigo under Health Workforce for the 21st Century supporting Minister of Health. I'll give a very brief um, recap. So last week, our topic was on adolescent and young people HIV surge. And our presenter was Dr. Chalilwe Chungu, quite an insightful session. And uh, we looked at the goals of the surge. We also looked at the strategic interventions of the surge and some of the roles and responsibilities of the key stakeholders in the implementation of the surge. So what was underscored in the presentation was that uh, young um, yeah, adolescents and young people are a priority population uh, because these, um, they are quite prone to HIV acquisition. And um, that um, we also did mention that the coordination in the implementation of the strategic intervention has never been more crucial than, than it is now, and that the SAGE was actually offering that platform. So that is a very, uh, very brief um, um, recap of last week's uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Sombo. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Nomsa. Indeed, adolescents and men are left behind in the pandemic. For us to reach that last mile of now 95.95, we need to really focus efforts to, with the men and adolescents. With that said, we'll, we'll go quickly into the Eastern case. We are hoping to have four cases subject to how we, um, the network responds to this. We will try to reach uh, four cases. So we'll start with Eastern province. Uh, Dr. Mildred, please go ahead with sharing your case. Please let us know if you want us to share from the hub. Okay. Madam Nomsa, do you have any idea if the Eastern Province has joined? Dr. Mildred? No, good afternoon. Sorry, I had an interruption in my internet. I'm kindly asking if you could share from that end, please. No problem. Uh, 
As we await to share the slide deck, please tell us a bit about your facility and what you do. Over. Okay, sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Mildred Simbarashe. I'm at Kapata Urban Clinic. It's in Chipata, Eastern Province. I'm the HIV and TB medical officer. And at Kapata Clinic, we have a TX car of about 6,900. So we see quite a number of patients. It's a pretty busy clinic. So Mildred, uh, are you able to see our screen? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. There you go. Okay, thank you. So the patient I'm presenting is a male with the initials RK. He's a 50 year old who lives within the Kapata area in Chipata. He's been on ART since 2006, which is when he was diagnosed. And when I met him, he had no complaints, which was on the 21st of November, 2020. However, the caregiver raised some concerns about his aloof behavior. He would disengage in conversation and just wasn't cooperating at home like he used to before. For past medical history, he has a history of fitting in 2019. It was a once off. The fits were aborted when he was taken to the clinic and never recurred. He has no diabetes, no hypertension and no history of TB. For drug history, he's currently on TLD and clopomazin, 100 milligrams once a day, which was started in November, 2019. And the previous ART regimens before the TLD, before the TLD, he was on TLN, which was actually started in November 2019. And prior to the TLN, he was on TLE. Next slide, please. For his social history, he's a widower. He lost his wife in May 2020 to advanced HIV. She had anal cancer for which she was receiving both chemo and radiotherapy at UTH. He lives with his older sister and his two children. The oldest is a male 10 year old and there's a female six year old and both of them are HIV negative. They were tested. He's currently not working. And as for his mental history, from round about 2009 to 2019, family complained of him being quite violent and aggressive. So what he would do is engage in a lot of verbal fights and threaten to beat people, including his wife, but never actually beat anyone. And at the time, he was also taking a lot of alcohol, which um, they qualify as strong spirits, including cachaso, which he took on a daily basis. And he also smoked marijuana pretty much on a daily basis. In 2019, November, he tried to commit suicide and was stopped from hanging himself. And at that time, his wife was alive and aware of the cancer diagnosis. And the reasons he gave for wanting to commit suicide were that he didn't have a reason to live if his wife was going to die. In 2019, the caregivers noticed that he was quite forgetful and he would forget simple things like where he is or where he's supposed to be going. And so when they raised this alarm, he was switched from TLE to TLN in November, 2019. Currently, the caregivers complain that he refuses to take a bath, do his own laundry and just help out at home. And the reasons he gives for this is that he's tired or his arms hurt despite eating well. His appetite isn't great, but he actually, they have food at home. So he eats well, um, but says he doesn't have energy. He also disappears and they don't know where he goes. He sometimes leaves without saying where he's going. And they suspect that perhaps he started taking alcohol, but not as much as before. It's occasionally that he comes home smelling of alcohol. Next slide, please. 
for the physical exam conducted on the 21st of November, he had normal vitals with a blood pressure of 138.67, a pulse of 86, and his weight was 69 kilos, and he wasn't in respiratory distress. He wasn't pale or jaundiced. He was a fair nutritional status. And for the mental status exam, his appearance, he had normal gait with fair grooming and his clothes looked clean. For behavior, he followed requests but avoided eye contact. He was well oriented to time, person and place. For his speech and language, he had poverty of speech. Um, he spoke clearly but with a monotone and he avoided questions that were open-ended. He would keep his responses quite short. His affect was rather flat. And as for memory, both recent and remote were intact. Questions that we asked him had to do with where he, where he is, yes. where he was at the time, and whether he knew where he was the previous day, and both remote and recent memory were intact. The rest of the physical exam was non-remarkable. Um, the chest was clear, heart sounds regular, and the abdomen was scaphoid with no organomegaly. For the musculoskeletal exam, he had no edema and we checked for needle prick markings, which he didn't have any. Next slide, please. So for his viral load profile, we managed to track some of the results that are not shown on the slide. The one showing on the slide is for 2020 and he was virally suppressed. Prior to that, in October, 2019, he had a high viral load of 97,300. And in June, 2019, he was actually suppressed. And the most recent viral load as at January, 2021 is that he's suppressed. So he is currently doing well on his ART regimen with a viral load of 76 copies. Next slide, please. So our questions, the first one is, how can we fully assess the patient's mental illness and attend to him holistically? And the second one, what universally recognized tools are available? And finally, how do we ensure he does not revert back to substance use? Well, Thank you. Um, Dr. Simbereshi, thank you so much for that uh, uh, concise and very clear presentation. At this point, we would like to get any questions for the Eastern Province team over this patient who in summary is a 50-year-old male on TLD, currently suppressed, of course, on a background of non-suppression, but he's currently suppressed. Uh, was seen in clinic and they were concerned about his um, lack of interaction and his lack of making eye contact and aloof, uh, aloof conduct. That's how the team now got uh, concerned about him. Um, of note is that in 2019, he lost his wife who had a cancer diagnosis. Uh, she died from anal cancer and it looks like these events are related to the time of this diagnosis when he even attempted uh, suicide. At the moment, he seems to not be very cooperative. He does not help out around the house as he uh, says he's always tired. When they examined him, he looked fine and he had no more vitals. Of note on the mental state exam is that he made no eye contact. He spoke in a, in a monotone and his affect was flat. However, he had fair grooming. Um, in terms of labs, he had a CD4 of 23 that was charted, but he's actually now suppressed. The questions from the Eastern Province team is, how can we fully assess the patient's mental illness and tend to him in a, a holistic manner? And what are university, universally recognized tools uh, that are available, are there any? And how do we avoid that he goes back to substance uh, abuse? Of note is that uh, he used to use a bit of alcohol, though on this examination, he had no needle pricks that uh, suggested um, injection drug use, but occasionally does come home with an alcohol smell on him. Any questions for Dr. Mildred?
Are there any hands there? Okay. What did I say? Okay. Please feel free to raise your hand if there's any question. What's happening to this one? Dr. Sombra, there's a question. There's a question in the chat. You've seen it. Um, I'm actually looking for it. I can see Dr. Muni has raised their hand. Dr. Muni, please go ahead before I go to the chats. Dr. Muni, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you to be on this platform. Can you hear me? Can hear you very well. Please proceed. Thank you very much. So uh, concerning the first question, okay, um, uh, in the presentation, there was a little touch about the, what the family is saying, uh, that he doesn't know where he's going and that kind of thing. So uh, I think one aspect that has to be pursued in this man to understand his uh, problem is to have a, a very detailed uh, collateral history about his day-to-day -day life at home. Because in the presentation, I got the impression that this man uh, could be having some cognitive deficit, but then on the mental state examination, he's okay. So I, I find that disparity there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muni. Uh, alongside this, maybe Mildred or anyone else, um, the, alongside what Dr. Muni has said, there's also a question, what did the initial cognitive screening show? Did this improve with change in the antiviral medication? Remember patient moved from TLE to TLN to TLD. Did the cognition improve? What was the initial baseline? Mildred? Thank you, Dr. Falochi. Um, So from what's on record, I don't think his his mental well-being was actually put on record. Perhaps it was noted that he, he had some unusual mannerisms, but there's nothing on record. So from November last year, I think that was the first time we started recording a full sort of mental state exam. But what I can say just to answer the question a little bit is when he was switched from TLE to TLN, the forgetfulness improved. Um, but it looks like there was a new introduction of him being disengaged and disinterested. So it's, it's more of a new finding compared to the forgetfulness that he had, because he doesn't forget anymore, but he's now just aloof. So I'm just not sure if anyone recorded his mental state prior to November when we saw him for the first time. Over. That's very helpful. I think there was a question on collateral. They, they are, were you able to get uh, into detail with the family? Do we have somebody yes. that can give good collateral? Yes. So the older sister who lives with him is very helpful and she, she gives all the information we ask for. Um, however, there's some questions she couldn't answer because she only started living with him round about November last year. So for most of the history, it actually came from her because he, he didn't seem either willing or um, open enough to give us some of the details about the past, especially surrounding his wife's loss. So the history is collateral, most of it from his older sister, but she doesn't really know a lot about him prior to November 2019. Thank you so much, Miriam. That's, that's very helpful. Do we have any questions from the rest of us in the um, network? Am I missing a hand? Do we understand the context for this so that we go to Mildred's uh, questions? I must say, I'm actually not surprised that at baseline you didn't have all the information because this is an area where we don't explore any further. It requires somebody that's very attentive or has a very low threshold for picking out these things. Most of us would probably just dismiss this person and say, oh, he's suppressed, so he should be fine. Uh, Charles Shamaninda, please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, it's a beautiful presentation. Um, my concern was on the mental state examination. I think it was not comprehensive. For instance, uh, parameters such as the perceptual and thought disorders were not highlighted. Secondly, I would like to know why this patient is on the clopromazine. Thank you, I submit. Okay, so that, um, so that uh, sort of answers your question, uh, Mildred, on the mental uh, um, state exam. We are, we're asking how can we make a better assessment of this? And one of the things they've suggested is that you need to do a perceptual assessment and the thought assessment. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's another question. Any question? Yes, I think go ahead. Sorry, I think the previous speaker asked a question about why he's on chlorpromazine. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Um, so the clopromazine was started when he exhibited the violent behavior. So I think the clinicians that saw him um, oh, for the violence probably wanted to, to treat manic behavior. So they put him on the clopromazine and it seemed to calm him down from what the sister said. So he has been on it since. November 2019 and hasn't been, um, the dose hasn't been changed. It's just been maintained. Okay, is that okay? That's okay. And the explanation for the clopromazine was to treat a mania. Is that okay? The question was why is the patient on clopromazine? And the reason given by the facility is that they were trying to control his mania. Any comments on that? Okay, so we'll go on to the um, uh, other question here, Dr. Simenda. Uh, any consideration on the fact that antipsychotic drugs as prescribed accelerate the dolutegravir metabolism? Can this lead to underdosing of the recipient of care and later have unsuppressed viral load in future? Yes, we are. Dr. Simenda, did you get the question? Hello, yes, I'm just reading the question now. I'm just reading the question now. It seems the only antipsychotic prescribed here is chlorpromazine. And uh, from this presentation, uh, chlorpromazine it does not react, uh, interact so far. There isn't much data on its uh, inducement. But if we had a drug like to control the fits, carbamazepine, it's well known to activate the cytochrome P450 microenzyme system. That uh, tends to accelerate the right. metabolism of many other drugs, even beyond the retail drug. The only drawback for the use of uh, chlorpromazine, which I was going to tell you later, was that with the history of fitting and alcohol use, Propromazine actually facilitates for more fits or it can worsen the picture of fitting. So in this case, we needed to choose another um, antipsychotic uh, to treat or limit it to the time when he had a lot of positive symptoms like violence and agitation to control that behavior in the short period only. Um, so Dr. Zimenda, are you suggesting that they stop the clopromazine because it looks like they've had success. He hasn't had any breakthrough seizures despite being on clopromazine. Any comment on that? Yes, indeed. I still have the comment that um, we have the major risk that uh, he's a man who's been using alcohol. They even mentioned that he's using spirits. So we, we haven't gotten the full picture, but it may suggest that he is dependent on alcohol. 
alcohol itself can lead to a complications, what we call RAM fits. In the presence of cropromazine, cropromazine reduces the seizure threshold. So he's more likely to have more fits. It would be yeah. better to use in that setting, like haloperidol, even a low dose of 2.5 milligrams of haloperidol would be effective to control both his uh, psychosis and uh, behavior patterns. Thank you very much, Dr. Simenda. So the clopromazine question has brought a, a new suggestion. Any comment on that, Mildred, before we proceed? I know there was a question on um, clopromazine uh, lowering the amount of dolutegravir. Actually, you don't expect any interaction between dolutegravir and clopromazine. So in terms of dolutegravir, that's fine. But in terms of the context of this patient, Dr. Mildred, the experts are suggesting that you actually use haloperidol as opposed to propromazine. Any comment on that? Um, I think we have taken note. Um, I think the clopromazine was continued because there was no further mental state assessment that was done. So it was just a continuation. Every visit he would come, no one would change the drugs. But we've taken note and we'll, we'll do as the experts have advised. Thank you. Thank you, Mildred. I think that's great advice. It's fair that we are now looking into the case deeply. Uh, is there any other clarifications or contributions to this case before I ask Dr. Lekani to give us his comments? Okay, so uh, Dr. Venevive, um, there's another question from Brian Myla from Mildred. Why, why did we choose clopromazine? Was it a question of availability? Do you have haloperidol at your facility? So the choice of clopromazine was made at our referral hospital and not at the clinic. So I am not sure if haloperidol is available at the moment. I would need to check, but it was a matter of continuity from the higher level tertiary hospital and not at the clinic. Thank you very much, Mildred. I actually appreciate the context of, of this and the contribution is that sometimes you may want to use one drug, but you go for what's available despite your situation. So that's a very good observation. Dr. Dr. Lekani, are you able All to right, help us? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Sombo. Uh, so my comment here would be that, well, the team has done the best that they can considering the, the circumstances and maybe the resources available on the ground. Um, it would really be good to go in, into details about the, in, in, in terms of the history, you know, like um, I always say that we are very nosy people as psychiatrists and just to say that someone is aloof, it might not really guide you to the diagnosis because as it is, I'm now starting to think, is this someone who's maybe uh, depressed and we haven't really addressed it fully? Is this someone who might be psychotic? Uh, maybe even looking at the duration, are you even pointing us uh, to something like schizophrenia based on some of the information that you have given us? So uh, my advice would be, uh, is it possible to just have this person come back and uh, reassess a full mental state done, uh, if possible, like it, it is guided in the book, and then uh, choose the drugs to use carefully. If we are going, because remember that some of this, these drugs, like um, the antipsychotics, it might even give you side effects that will mimic a depression. And if someone is already depressed, you might actually think you are getting them worse. So it will just be good to reassess the patient with the information that we have got from here today. And then all, like going forward, consider a very low dose of haloperidol if this patient needs to be on antipsychotics. But also consider the other circumstances that the person is uh, going through. Having lost the wife, probably not even employed or not, many, not making uh, any meaningful income, always tired and they're like, what are those symptoms pointing us to? Are we missing an underlying depression here that can even explain why he wants to drink beer again, why he's always lost in thought and seeming to be aloof? 
I think in the, in brief, that is what I would, uh, I would say. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lekani. You've dropped a lot of pearls there, but before I go there, I think the other question is, are there any universally recognized tools that they can utilize on this patient in terms of when to do the full assessment? Are there any recognized tools? Are maybe preferably validated in our population? So I'm happy that you've, already, you've actually answered part of what I was going to say. Yes, we have these screening tools that we can use for depression, but then, uh, or even like for uh, multiple uh, mental disorders. But what I'm worried about is um, if you apply this tool in our context, you probably have to translate it into a local language that... Um, and then there are certain questions that will exist in English, very easy for you to phrase, but difficult to translate. Are we going to lose uh, the value of some of these questions or some of the answers based on the, uh, the, the tool not being validated for our population? So I would still think that um, it doesn't sound like we've hit a case a situation where this is very complicated that we need to refer it very, very upwards. The idea would be just maybe following the basic steps of doing a mental, uh, you know, a, a psychiatric history. Maybe the doctor can just spend a bit of time, do a bit of revision, do a thorough psychiatric history, a thorough mental state. And if that doesn't point her to any uh, diagnosis based on what uh, she would have got, at that point, she can try maybe uh, the, the best tools which are about the simplest. Thank you. That gives us a lot of context. So the third question, before I summarize all this, is how do they prevent this man from relapsing into substance abuse? Do you have any suggestions? So, so one of the things that would cause him to relapse, as, and as an example, if he is depressed, uh, he might be self-medicating with uh, alcohol, trying to get by himself from some bit of sleep in the night, uh, or you know, try and escape some of his most depressing thoughts, and he ends up drinking. So it would be good to figure out what the underlying cause to his substance uh, misuse is, or you know, just to find out what the under, like what the underlying diagnosis is in this case. And then when you treat it appropriately, you take for instance, if it is a depression, you give him antidepressants. Again, even with antidepressants, you need to be careful with your choice of uh, medicines that you give so that you don't now cause more side effects, you don't cause interactions and end up having a medicine that is more complicated or a treatment that is more harmful than the disease you are trying to treat in the first place. So if the choice of drugs, again, would really come in so that you tailor the, 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 the the, the, the prescription to the underlying or the key symptom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lekani? Okay, he's muted. But thank you so much, Dr. Venevive. That is actually quite clear. So Mildred, I'll go through those recommendations. I think he has actually tackled all the three very well. So he actually wishes to commend the team uh, on the work that has been done considering the resources and circumstances. So he's saying, well done, but we need to go back as the team has actually figured out. We need to get more history. Are we dealing with a depression? Are we dealing with a psychosis or a schizophrenia? Because we, um, this may be the solution to everything that follows um, after that, because we don't seem to have gotten to the, the root diagnosis that may be tipping him. Let us also remember that he's in a very difficult situation. He lost his wife to advanced HIV. That is stressful enough. Losing someone to cancer is a very long road that could have also led to this. We need to remember that he's unemployed and um, that uh, if we do need to treat, we can consider low dose haloperidol, but only after we've done a full assessment of this patient. They have encouraged us that for us to treat psychiatric illness, you don't just grab a drug off the shelf, you have to consider side defects and other comorbidities. And in terms of any universally um, uh, accessible tools, 
I think it goes back again to our first step, which is let us first do a thorough history and using the standard tools that we have, because likely we may be able to get to this problem without going to higher levels of um, assessment, such as uh, the BEX2, which may be a bit complex, especially when you think about using it in our population. As for him not going back to treatment, again, we have to get to the diagnosis, or at least as close as, it to the, as we can get to it and rule out other things. So once we get to the bottom of the diagnosis and treat it appropriately, we may find that he may not have to tend to alcohol. So thank you very much, Dr. Venevive. So that's the summary of that. Dr. Simenda, do you have anything to add before we go to our next case? Uh, thank you, Chair. I think a lot has been said. And um, yeah, just to add good. and summarize that indeed, this patient has a lot of risk factors. The life event of losing a spouse, or the use of marijuana itself, and the alcohol. Alcohol actually kills neurons. Now, marijuana causes a psychosis. There's no doubt about that. We know it's contemporary, but in a lot of susceptible patients, marijuana use can lead to what we call amotivation syndrome. It's similar to schizophrenia. Now, these symptoms of slowness, dirtiness, um, lack of um, uh, hygiene, maintenance, is similar also to, like, to depression. So that's why we need to do a thorough history and gauge, because in psychiatry, we make a diagnosis based on constellation of symptoms into a specific uh, syndrome and say, this is what it is. But in the absence of that, we can target to treat the symptoms which are here. It is here we see that, yes, there's some cognitive decline, but we needed to, to assess it. We also, if it were possible in Chipata to have an EEG done, this man could still have, be having the um, subclinical seizures going on with the alcohol use. Then in terms of the tools, yes, we have the tools. Um, so the assessment is done by history and the thorough uh, mental health examination. As for the tools, as Lekani said, we have the tools, but most of these are to be used by trained people. There are two common tools that are used. The first one, which can be used by any health worker is called the mean international neuropsychiatric um, tool to just diagnose or lead you towards a diagnosis. The second one is the SCID. This one is for more advanced professionals. And in addition, almost all conditions in mental health, like depression, like schizophrenia, has its own tool, which is developed. These are also common on the WHO website, which we can download. But in that setting of Chipata, it would also be useful to have, for example, a clinical officer psychiatry help them to actually come up with a diagnosis by doing a thorough mean mental state examination and a few uh, investigations to help with a definitive diagnosis. Um, so by and large, with cognitive, there was a question about the cognitive decline and what it was at the time of examination. In most cases of organic um, decline in cognitive functioning. We find this a syndrome of waxing and waning. Today you examine the patient, the memory will be dysfunction. The following day when you do the same exam, the memory will be improved. Sometimes even during the same day, it's called the sound downer. The memory can be better at one point, but as the day progresses, it worsens, vice versa, it changes. Now, he also has HIV. Sometimes even when you are on ART, your cognitive functions can still decline. So he has a number of risk factors. HIV itself can cause a neuropsychiatric uh, decline. The alcohol, uh, marijuana would cause a psychosis-like syndrome. And uh, so, and the fitting itself, about four major factors which, which are impeding on him. So those we need to look at. So in terms of treatment, for the just the psychosis, the haloperidol works, especially when he has active symptoms would be fine. A higher dose would worsen the slowness. The, the thing that they're talking about, the slowness, the apathy is called negative symptoms. So we don't want someone to go in that negative, but to improve on those negative uh, presentations. So a low dose would do well, but if indeed uh, depression is also established, it would be worth to treat him for depression. 
As for the substance relapse uh, prevention, this is well catered for. I think Eastern Province will also start the CETA program now. CETA um, uh, psychotherapy, especially if this substance abuse is mild and moderate. I mean, not to the levels of dependence or even in dependence, the CETA would be very good approach to treat him uh, using uh, that is psychotherapy and the techniques. And this can be ongoing for a number of sessions to, to teach him new things and ways of problem solving and coping with the current um, numerous issues that he's going through. Maybe I end there in the interest of time. Dr. Simian, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of information. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. It looks like to manage these sorts of patients, you need, aside the wealth of knowledge, you need to be extremely knowledgeable and be able to consult. If I had a patient like this in front of me, I would definitely be phoning if I cannot take the patient to that type of care. But aside that, you need to be to have a lot of time. You need to be able to give these patients your time because it looks like you almost have to observe over time what's going on with this person. You cannot rush to conclude with this patient. So time is everything. Uh, so colleagues, the dawn of a new era is upon us in HIV care. We need to care beyond viral suppression. He is suppressed, but it's very clear he has an array of issues going on where we can intervene. Mildred, once again, we want to say thank you very much. Job well done on this case. We will be sending through the recommendations for you. Just um, some time to ask any more questions if you have. None at the moment, Dr. Poloshi. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone and the experts as well. We've taken note. Yay, I'm giving a little clap. That was a very good case. Thank you very much. At this point, we will stop sharing our deck and move on to our case from Lusaka. Uh, Cuthbert, are you ready? Sure, I'm ready. Good afternoon. Please go ahead and share your your presentation. Uh, I've seen Dr. Chiro has joined us. You are welcome. Dr. Angel Chiro has joined us. And she says that was a very good case, Mildred. Cuthbert, please share your screen. Can be shared from that end. This is Lusaka. Okay, we'll do that. Please tell us about your facility and what you do in the facility. We will share your decks over. That's Lusaka. Okay, uh, this is Mtendere Health Post, based in Kafue District. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, afternoon. I'm presenting on the case of uh, MB, who is female 39, non-positive on art for over six years, initiated on treatment in 2016. So this is the client who has the background of treatment interruption for more than a year. So this client had de defaulted for a year. Uh, in 2019, August, the patient returned to care and was enrolled in EAC and was virally suppressed after three months of EAC sessions. The client continued on TAE until uh, 21st January 2021, when the client was transitioned to TOD. Uh, two weeks later, after the, the transition, the patient came with symptoms as follows, irrelevant talk, laughing anyhow on top of her voice, claiming that she had some things, uh, claiming that she had a big hand on her feet that could only be healed by God. Occasionally, she refused to bath and do her laundry. And she was uh, stated that she was feeling something like uh, things climbing on her skin, when in fact not. Then immediately 7040 was contacted for consultation and we advised to take the patient back to TLE and refer the patient to the hospital for further investigation and management. Under our past medical history, this is a reactive patient uh, who is a married woman. Okay, and our drug history, the patient is on TLE since 2016. 
and was transitioned to TLD in 2020 and back to TLE on February 4th, 2021. The patient is on septrin, INH, and B6. Currently, she's given haroperidol and aten from the hospital as they are managing her. So on our social history, this is a patient who is married, as I said, a housewife, a husband who is also on treatment. She takes alcohol and she smokes. Next slide. So on our physical <clears throat> examination, uh, these were the vitals that were taken on 21st January, 2021. The weight was 42, temperature 36.3, blood pressure 130, 93, uh, respiration 20, palsy 96. So on the general condition of our patients, she was fully conscious, a febrile to touch. And on our mental state examination, appearance, she was not well groomed and kept. The behavior, she followed the request, but avoided eye contact. Then her speech was incoherent, pressured speech with some fright of ideas. The mood was elevated with appropriate affect. She was oriented to time, place, and person and she was uh, exhibiting delusions of communication direct with God. So she also claimed that she had uh, tactile hallucinations. The memory recent and the remote was intact. The insight was new. Respiratory, CVS and GIT was unremarkable. Next slide. So those were the investigations that were done on our patient. So upon the view of our patient in 2019, the CD4, the first CD4 we collected was 173, that was in 2019, uh, August. In December, it raised to 101, to 401, I mean. Then 2020, December, it was at 1506. Then those uh, AOT, AOST, we had, uh, 9.4 that was in 2019 but December and 20 December there were no results that were documented in the file. The create nine which was at 48 that was in 2019. 2020 there were no documented results in the file but the HB in 2019 we had uh, 9.4 that was in December that was in August and the 11.1 that was in December 2019. Then there are the copies of our, our viral load that were collected from our patient. So the one that was collected in 2019, August, the patient had 139,851 copies. Yeah. Okay. Then in December 2019, the patient was suppressed. This came after the sessions of ERC that were done on the patient. So the suppression, uh, patient showed suppression in December while on TLE. And also in December 2019, the patient was still suppressed. Then 2020, the patient was transitioned to TLD. Next slide. So those are our questions. Can TLD cause psychosis? And what approach of management can be done to this patient? Thank you. Cut good. Thank you very much for that. Before we go to any questions or contributions from our network, a brief summary of this 39-year-old female on ART for the past six years, uh, discontinued care, but back in care as of August 2019. Of course, viral load was very high when she was back in care. Uh, but has managed to suppress over the past uh, six to 12 months. Of note is that due to the um, recommendation by the Ministry of Health to move all suppressed individuals, that is patients with a viral load of less than 1,000 to TLD, this patient was transitioned to TLD. However, two weeks into this transition, she developed... Um, symptoms concerning for psychiatric illness. She was talking irrelevant and she, had, she was having delusions and was actually refusing to self-care. She also had this uh, tactile, uh, a feeling that something was crawling over her skin. 
So that's how she was taken back to TLG. At the moment, the patient is on haloperidol and Arten. She is married and uh, her husband is on ART. She does take alcohol and she smokes. Uh, on examination, um, she's actually weighing, she weighs 42 kgs. Unfortunately, we don't have a height. So we are not sure if this is appropriate for her height. Her mental state exam is that she's actually not well groomed. Um, she avoids high contacts, though she does follow requests. Her speech is incoherent with pressured speech with some flight of ideas. Her mood is noted to be elevated while her affect is appropriate. She was oriented in time, place, and person. She, she says that she sees, she's able to talk to, to God. She's able to communicate with God, God and she has stuck to her hallucination. Her memory, both recent and remote, are uh, intact. So the question is, can TLD cause psychosis? And does CETA have a role in the management of this patient? We'll take some question. There's a very good question here. I wish you could unmute your microphone, Himavala, Himavala CC. Uh, thank you, Dr. Foloshi. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, it's an interesting case indeed. Um, and uh, I just wanted to find out if the rationale for switching the client from TOE to, I mean, from TOD to TOE uh, was actually justified uh, as far as the patient improvement is concerned. So I wanted to know if I told the patient improved after they decided to switch her back to TOE from TOD. Okay, so that's a double that, that's a double barreled question, eh? So the question is, one, what was the rationale of moving the patient back to Doluteguava to a favorite uh, cat bed? And was there improvement when we made this decision? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the rationale of changing the patient from TOE to back to TOE, uh, we noted that the patient was all well before the transition occurred. Immediately after the transition, the patient manifested with such symptoms. So we didn't just uh, change on our own, we had to do some consultation. And one of them, what, which we did, we called 7040. So we are advised to take the patient back to TOE and observe. Then they told us also to refer the patient to the hospital for further management. So we did that. Uh, fortunate enough, I think we could we didn't see the, the change there and then, but I think according to me, the patient stabilized after started the haloperidol and atin. Um, thank you very much. I hope uh, Himavala, that's Okay, so that was based on uh, a consultation that they had, and they're saying the patient got better. So in short, they felt there was a causal relationship between the start of the psychosis and the initiation of Dolutegrava. Mr. Njoga, please go ahead with your contribution. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting uh, case. Me, I, I want to find out, I think we have very little information about alcohol that has been stated. We have been told that this patient was abusing alcohol. Now, to which extent was this patient taking alcohol? Maybe it might also contribute, it could have also contributed to the illness. Maybe they can just clarify on that. Okay, uh, according, according to the husband, uh, she says she used to take alcohol occasionally, not on daily basis. That was the information we got from the husband. Thank you, uh, Cuthbert. Uh, Nathan, please go ahead and ask your question. Nathan, anyway, Nathan is asking, is this a new case or a relapse? I guess a relapse of the psychiatric condition? Cuthbert, was she a previously non-psychiatric patient? 
Okay, according to the husband, Hashi, him denies to have any history of psychiatry in, in their family. But according to the information she has about the same lady, she said there's nothing like that. And she said, he said it was kind of the first time seeing such thing happening in the house. Thanks, Cuthbert. At this point, I would ask uh, Dr. Chira to maybe zero in on this case before we go to the uh, questions. Dr. Angel. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Falashi. Hi, hi, Angel. Please go ahead. Um, I think it's a very good case, just like the other case. A lot of things to um, think about. I think somebody talked about the alcohol. So it's very important to get a very thorough history and point at um, the points of concern. So alcohol was raised. It's very important to get a full history about that. When was the last drink? How much alcohol is this patient actually taking? Because it also brings in issues of compliance uh, in terms of now trying to get the patient to be compliant because there's already is a history of uh, defaulting. Um, the other thing is, um, as with the other patient, I think uh, it's important to assess fully also for other symptoms. So um, I know the patient came in with uh, some grandiose and uh, delusions and some tactile hallucinations. So that you're pointing at an actual diagnosis. Um, is this, may, is, this, is this patient manic? Is this patient having just overt um, psychosis? Could this patient actually be depressed as well? So just because a patient is coming in with um, uh, some grandiosity and is elated, may, the may, patient may still have um, a depression. I think those of note, reduced personal hygiene. And then those also, I think not, uh, motivated, the patient didn't seem to be motivated. So I think that's important in, in, in assessing the history. Thank you very much, Dr. Angel. I think that's very helpful. Again, we have been reminded that we need to go and get a more detailed history because it looks like what it can appear to be on the surface may actually be very different. So you need to bring everything into perspective. It's, it's not enough to say that somebody was elated and they had these grandiose ideas of talking to God, so they have got mania or psychosis. You may find that they're actually sitting on a depression. So that's very uh, useful, Dr. Uh, Chira. Mr. Simenda, do you want to answer if TLD causes psychosis? Yes, um, yes, Chairperson. Um, the issue of whether TLD causes psychosis or not, we have to look at the mechanism of how psychosis is brought about. From the scientific point of view, this is uh, without considering social and psychological causes, from the pharmacological point of view, we are talking about D2 receptor activation. So far, tenofovir, lamivudine, and dirutegravir we do not have significant interaction to cause a rise in dopamine that can be associated with psychosis. So on that basis alone, we are saying that most likely it is not the TOD. But what we know from the professional side of mental health, a female who is 39 years old and is on uh, treatment is taking a bit of alcohol. But even without the alcohol, she has presented with a manic-like episode, okay? Grandiose, talking on top of her voice and so on. So this is, maybe we don't have the duration. It may not qualify, but in the presence of HIV, we call it a manic-like episode. It's a very common presentation at Chinama in the female world. We admit them. The beauty about this, is that it's a, an acute episode and it goes away quickly. We give them a low dose haloperidol. One, because people with HIV, the brain, the brain barrier, uh, bla I want to say, the, the BBB is, a, uh, let me say fragile, like it's not in a good state. When you give a normal dose that you give to people that are not HIV positive, 
the one who is HIV positive, the side effect of sedation and other extra pyramidal side effects are worse. So for that reason, we give a lower dose. For example, we give five milligram haloperidol as a, a usual dose, but with HIV, we give 2.5. And that is enough because they are very sensitive to the drug, okay? And this episode typically lasts for a short time, but we continue giving a relapse prevention for another six weeks or so. So this is a good candidate for that. And we needed not to change the drug to TLE. The, the drawdown of TLE is that the efferance component tends to split the psychic functions of the brain. A patient may experience vivid dreams and things like that, only efferance. That can worsen the picture of who? psychosis. So we needed not to switch back. And TLD, unless other information comes up in future, it does not cause psychosis. Dr. Simenda, right there, you dropped a, a few pearls. Like I didn't know about going with lower doses of haloperidol in people with HIV. So that's very, very useful to know. So yes, so typically, uh, Dolitegrava should not give you a psychosis. However, post-marketing reports have come out that you may get some psychiatric patients presenting with psychiatric illnesses. So in, okay, in, on occasion, so post-marketing, this has come up. But thank you so much, Dr. Siminda. That's very helpful. I believe there is a link from someone uh, citing psych uh, psychosis as one of them, but it's, it's very rare. It's very rare, but it does, it can happen. But this, these are post-marketing reports. And uh, as Dr. Simenda says, we are trying to move away from the NNRTIs. So for so someone like this, you may want to look for other alternatives if you are very convinced that really they needed a change. But as Dr. Simenda has said, this tends to be a very short-lived episode and they will actually revert to actually their baseline and you only give it for six weeks and they will be fine. Uh, we have another question here, uh, Dr. Angel Chiwa, what is the role of CETA in the management of this client? What is the role of the common elements of treatment approach? Um, so it definitely has a role. Uh, the, with most mental uh, health issues, we're heavily reliant on uh, psychological aspects. So we really rely on therapy. So CETA will bring that into it. So a lot of the times um, when patients are just given medication, they tend to not do so well. So in somebody who has issues, so for instance, this patient has a chronic illness, uh, there's, uh, there's issues of alcohol, there's issues um, of, uh, of mania. So in addressing with medication, we also need to use um, therapy. So CETA definitely has a big role. Thank you very much, Dr. Chiwa. Kath Beck, any questions or are those recommendations very clear? Yeah, it's clear. I, uh, I, I, I don't know, but we are, we'll follow up with the hospital because the patient is being managed by the hospital at the moment for the psychosis aspect, but we'll, we'll follow the patient. Now, my question to Dr. Smenda is, uh, should we take the patient back to, to TLD? <laughs> exactly, please do. They, they you, you will benefit more from TLD. Okay, so uh, what if we take him back again to essence? What should we do? So I'm kind of asking for your line. What I'm oh, giving no. you is expert <laughs> advice. It won't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. So, if we, yeah. yes, Dr. For the Smenda. meantime, just treat the manic-like episode with the antipsychotic low dose like haloperidol for now. Uh, and that question you're asking on CETA, typically psychotherapy, unless in very specialized settings, does not work well for actual psychosis. So actual psychosis, we treat with a drug then the component of CETA that will be used there is just psychoeducation to educate the patient about what is going through and bring about assertiveness. 
But for the, this psychosis, you need the drug to control it. Thereafter, he can go into uh, assertive self-efficacy training and so on. That's so what thank, thank you so much. So the recommendation is that you take the patient back to TLD. They are still on haloperidol. So that may help, but of course that the issue becomes when you start, you start with withdraw. However, as with all patient care, it is a case by case management. So you observe the patient, if there's anything, Dr. Simenda, Dr. Chira, Dr. Venevive are available to provide further care for these patients. So it doesn't end here. So we'll take step one, which is back to TLD, and then further advice will be given from that cut bed. But thank you for being so cautious. Thank you for bringing us this case. I have gotten quite a number of calls regarding the, if they are, they have Swiss and they are now getting these psychiatric illnesses. So that's a very good case, cut bed. Thank you once again. We have time for one more case. I see St. Francis, the hands just went up, and uh, Papi, St. Francis, please go ahead as we prepare to share the case from Western Province. Western, please share your screen. St. Francis, go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you. I would like to find out why, you, why was the patient put on me as a nurse that when there's use of confusion. Thank you. Uh, uh, that one is just drug history. She took isonazide before if this occurred. Uh, oh. Papi, Western Province, please share your screen. Dr. Ba Papi Banza, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Doc. I, I, I don't know if I saw it, uh, uh, the, the, the viral load is high and we are going to switch again the clients to TLD. So are we not going to, 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 to to do the way we are always doing uh, before switching, we have to make sure that the client is suppressed. Thank you. So actually the last viral load, the patient was suppressed for this patient, they were suppressed. So they can go back to TLD in regards of uh, viral load. Is okay, that okay, thanks. Dr. Papi? Okay, thank you. Yes, I didn't see it, I didn't see it, yeah. Okay, yes, but that's an important question. Our guideline still stands that only patients with suppressed viral load can have that that's a monotherapy switch. Of course, this is pending um, data from one of the studies we are doing as a, a university teaching hospital called Vicent. We will give further guidance based on the findings. So that's a good question, Dr. Abbas. Uh, uh, we have Confucius with the case from Western Province. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a... Uh, Member Confucius uh, presenting on the case from Western Province in Alora. These are very good cases. Yes, Confucius, yeah, go ahead. Case from, yes, I'm saying uh, we're presenting from Western Province in Alora. We are presenting a case of a female 24 who was diagnosed with HIV and MCH during Child Health Week in November 2020. Client was last tested HIV negative in July 2020. The positive result of the mother prompted uh, the staffs to test the baby using a rapid test, which also came out positive. The baby is one year, three months, and he is the last born in a family of two. Currently still breastfeeding. The father's status is unknown as he resides in Kulu. After testing, the client refused to start ART and also declined consent for correction of a confirmatory DBS on the baby, threatening to commit suicide and also to kill the baby. Following subsequent counseling on 12th, uh, February 2021, she consented to the of her child on ART, but declined her own initiation. Uh, Counseling is still ongoing. History of suicidal ideation. This is the second time she is pondering suicide. Her first episode was at the age of 15 during her tradition cere initiation ceremony when she was told about the circumstances surrounding her mother's death. The client was 
one month old when her mother died. Uh, social support, she's single, not receiving child support, uh, sales tomato at the market. Uh, drug uh, history for the baby and uh, cough February 2021. The baby was initiated on ABC 3TC of Inova. Uh, reason because she was tested uh, positive November 2020. On the same date, she was also commenced on CTX. Fifth exams. 10th March 2021, uh, plant was stable, uh, not pale, temperature 37 degrees Celsius, PP10682 millimeter of mercury, pulse 55 beats per minute, duration 20 per minute, weight 56 kg, height 152. Mental state examination on 15th March 2021, uh, patient is oriented. A uh, place and person, a uh, memory intact, both long and a short term, mood normal, concentration is good, perception, no hallucinations, judgment, sound. Available results as of 24 uh, November 2020, HIV initiated. On 12th uh, February 2021, that is the baby, DBS accorded and she declined. I repeat, sample correction for confirmation. Our questions Is our client a candidate for SETA? Second question. What is the optimal management of a grant with uh, murder or suicide ideation? And how long, uh, um, how do we uh, safeguard the well being of the child in the care of the client with suicidal ideation? Thank you. Thank Dr. you so Chair. much. Thank you so much, Confucius. That's a, an interesting but sad case. We will allow a few contributions or questions from the network. This is the last case we are taking. We will not do four. So our colleagues from Western Province present to us a 24-year-old female who had an HIV diagnosis via outreach services. They went for MCH and they managed to get that she was positive and uh, has this child who also had a positive test but awaits um, the PCR, the DBS. Um, the issues around this is that she actually declined uh, treatment and threatened to kill herself and the baby. Of note is that she has had previous uh, suicidal ideation at the age of uh, uh, 15. She does have a partner whose status is unknown, but uh, an excuse was made for him is that it's because he lives in Mukulu. But this is just an excuse, isn't it? Because this man also does not provide child support. So this woman is actually unemployed and has no support and is taking care of this child on her own. Uh, of note is that the child is on a back of a 3 tc lopiniva and uh, a septrin cotrimoxazole. The question for our experts and to us, the rest of the network is, is she a candidate for CETA? I see IT brought up the physical. Sorry, I forgot about that. Her physical was unremarkable and her mental state was that she had good long-term and remote memory. Her mood was what they considered to be normal. She had good concentration. She had no hallucination. She had sound judgment and was actually oriented. So they're asking, is this client who has suicidal ideation a candidate for CETA? Any questions for Confucius before the experts uh, give us their opinion on this case, their expert advice? Any questions? Okay. 
Chatonda, please read out that. In psychotic or HIV patients, apart from reducing the dose of alopinavir, <coughs> is it advisable to reduce the dosage of arsen as well? Okay, that's from Gordon Mwase. Uh, that will be answered as they answer, is our client a candidate for CETA? Can we discuss? <laughs> I love this. Any comments, Dr. Lekani? Is this a candidate for CETA considering her mental state exam seemed fine? That is not uh, CETA. CETA is uh, something we are bringing in now in management. We have a question from Ruth. Uh, Ruth, there's a question here. Is this because she is thinking of killing herself and is she having memories of her late mother? Uh, Hello. Yes. yes. Yeah, this is Ruth, a counselor for CETA and psychosocial counseling HIV. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, yes, she's qualified for CETA in the sense that she's thinking of killing herself. Uh, and uh, she tried to kill herself when she was 15 years. I'm sure even now, the same memories for her late mother is contributing. So she's qualified for, she's qualified for CETA. Thank you very much, Ruth. So there is the element that she lost her mother at 15. She got upset because she lost her mother when she was very young. And now yes, she has a um, now that she's yes, going on a lot. So those memories may be coming back. So that's advice from Ruth. Thank you very much. Any contributions before we let Dr. Simenda zero in on this one? Or am I seeing Dr. Angel? Dr. Simenda, have we lost him? Yes, I'm here, Chair. Uh, good okay. afternoon. Another good case today that we, we've listened to. Um, just to remind the network that uh, mental health is very wide and broad. We don't only deal with psychiatric conditions, but we also deal with uh, psychological problems, emotional problems, and uh, also um, a mixture of that, and sometimes mere intellectual uh, disability, which can be mild, moderate, or severe. Or yeah. So in the patient like the one we have here, we see a certain pattern of behavior that can be consistent with a personality disorder like borderline bipolar, uh, borderline personality disorder. This person is rather impulsive. You see, when faced with a crisis, she wants to resort to suicide. There's explosive anger, you know? There's, uh, she is unclear of her image and what she wants in life. Sort of, she has deficient uh, mental resources to handle even the minor stress. The HIV has come, yes, but is the solution to take your own life? No. So there is um, a lot of uh, inability to cope with the life stressors, to cope with the day-to-day, -day, because HIV today is a common problem and it does not warrant suicide because there is a solution. So this is a patient who will benefit from cognitive restructuring from thinking negatively, from the helplessness that she has learned and hopelessness. She is a person who can cause self-harm. In, in BP, in those deficient personality disorders I'm talking about, if a good history was taken, maybe we can diagnose that she has a personality disorder or a mild uh, mental intellectual disability, which can bring about this kind of thinking behavior. She it also seems that she is unable to maintain a relationship. This is also a deficiency if one cannot maintain a relationship with someone who they have uh, two children with. So she will need that kind of care to be actually enrolled in CETA so that we give the psychotherapy to enhance what we call developmental psychology, 
what should a female of 24 years be doing? And what should be the thinking processes that she must harbor that will be productive for her life going forward? So we may not find uh, a psychiatric um, diagnosis, but we'll find issues or matters that can be attended to by CETA or the mental health uh, fraternity. So she needs care, she needs to be enrolled, and uh, we can find a pattern, especially to focus on developmental uh, psychology and changing the deep-seated cognitive thinking, which is negative, which is not useful for her uh, in resorting to personality. But if we diagnose a personality disorder, again, most of these personality disorders of the cluster B are usually, they, they respond to uh, therapy. Uh, there's no actual medications for most of them, but if information is given, psychoeducation is given, the outlook is much better. But if there's a definite um, intellectual disability, then she would need a lot of help going forward to, to make her life more meaningful and improve the quality of life. So she needs help. It was a very good case. A very good case indeed, especially that you mentioned that it's not always just psychiatric issues that you deal with, it's also psychological issues that you deal with. Does it mean that you've answered uh, number two? Uh, there is a question on how do we manage people who have su suicidal ideations, these parasuicides, and how do we safeguard the well-being of this child in the care of somebody who has not only said that they will commit suicide, that they'll kill the baby too. It's true. Um, when, in these personality disorders where there's deficiency, anxious, anxiety, and so on, it's the core issue is the deficiency of uh, mental resources to deal with everyday life. So the escape is to commit suicide, or the escape would be to use substances. So she will benefit from help to improve on that deep-seated pattern of thinking which is destructive to herself. So she, she can really benefit from the, uh, the psychotherapy and ongoing supportive care. Uh, if it were possible, if she's so vulnerable, the social networks of um, um, Ministry of Social Welfare can also help in boosting her own demand so that the social determinants of health in her life are, are also sorted out to reduce on the that presence of stress throughout her life and care for the children to be received also from the parent, if that can also be enhanced, that would be a plus for her. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simend. I think that is uh, very clear. In short, this candidate, Mr. Confucius, is a client for CETA. CETA actually also deals with personality disorders such as uh, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder. So we can also think of those things and it seems she's actually displaying some intellectual incapability because of the way she's dealing with life stresses. More importantly is to probably also attempt to remove those stressors by empowering her socially. Remember, she has no social support. That type of stress is bound to break anyone down and drive them to actually having these sort of disorders or them manifesting themselves because it is stressful. And um, the child, of course, there's also the role of the social workers. We need to do further assessment on the home, uh, social determinants, but more importantly, we need to assist this woman actually maybe reach her fullest intellectual capacity, it may not be much, but that will be determined by a psychiatric assessment or an assessment by a psychologist. With that said, the Confucius, are these recommendations um, okay? Do you have any questions for our um, experts? Dr. Sombo. Another recommendation? Yes. Dr. Sombo. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, um, I'm calling from uh, Eastern Province, Chiparamba. Yes, please. Maybe before Confucius comes in, I just wanted to find out because I saw from the, the history that uh, they were not able to do DBS for that baby because they, they said like blood clotted, something like, like that. And the child was uh, convinced on the 
uh, full art. <laughs> so I don't know whether that was based, it was just based on the, uh, uh, the rapid test which was done. Because I feel it's better to pursue the DBS thing to, to establish the diagnosis yeah. of, of this child than just leaving it there because the blood protein. So I like said blood protein. I, I don't know. Uh, Thank you very work? much for that, uh, Paramba. Any comments on that? Uh, colleagues, Confucius, Joel, I see you are the mentor that uh, helped bring the life into this case. What is our um, plan for getting a definitive diagnosis for this baby? Can I just make a comment over the baby? Please, Joel, how are uh, you? Very fine. Uh, concerning the baby, the, DB, the DBS that was collected was collected later on uh, after engaging the, the mother into the counseling session. But after collecting the DBS, the moment it clotted, the mother refused, totally refused to collect another DBS. So we were forced to uh, start the, the child on treatment as we still engage the mother into the counseling session so as to uh, get a fresh DBS into us at 10. And like we just sit and wait until she agrees to a DBS being collected. It might be too late to it might be too late for us to manage this baby. But in this case, our decision um, was made to start the baby on treatment. Thank you. Is this baby breastfeeding, Joel? Yes. Okay. Uh, is that helpful? Our colleagues from Eastern Province, they could not proceed to collect any more blood. Rapid test was positive in a woman that continues to breastfeed without being on ART. So as bridging therapy, they decided to start ART while pursuing a confirmation of HIV. Is this okay with the Eastern team? I don't know whether in that case, since we are not sure whether just putting that child on the prophylaxis uh, would help or not. Like uh, uh, putting the child on the prophylaxis rather than uh, full art until we get a uh, Okay, so they do have a preliminary HIV positive case and are waiting to confirm. Dr. Simenda, any comments? There's a suggestion that they should have just started the child on prophylaxis, which in our setting is actually full ART. If you think about it, we use three drugs. <laughs> so whichever way <laughs> the child will be on ART, which is good for the baby because mom is actually not suppressed at this point. Uh, Dr. Simenda? Yes, Chair. I think the team did very well to start the, the child on the treatment, which is as, as effective as a full ART. Now, I also want to comment on the, this issue of refusal. It might look like it's, um, it's very important that we have an assessment done on uh, uh, this lady. Uh, I think Lewanika might be, have the capacity to diagnose uh, intellectual disability. <laughs> And at which case, it can be established whether this patient has legal or mental capacity to handle her own affairs. If that is declared, then in terms of care of the child, we can ha now have the professionals look after the child without relying on the consent from this lady if she's incapable of looking after herself. So this assessment might become uh, very important going forward. Yeah. I think that's a very important addition. Thank you so much, Dr. Simenda. It is four o'clock. We want to thank all our presenters who presented these cases, Cuthbert, Confucius, and Mildred. We want to thank Dr. Angel Chira, Dr. Venevive, Dr. Simenda, who are helping also with the rollout of CETA. And of course, thank you to the network. Please scan the start and end QR codes for you to have access to the cases. Next week, we will be talking about indicators in um, some of the key HIV priority areas and also looking at smart care and the increased uptake of TAFED. How do we manage that in smart care? Dr. Simenda and team, thank you very much to the network. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.